so far in this problem, we have been able to determine by applying the rational zero test, we came up with these rational zeros. By applying the real zeros, we figured out that there's either two or zero real zeros, and there's at, one, at least one negative, or there is exactly one negative real zero. All right? So how do we determine if we have zeros or not? Well, so far in this class, yeah, we applied synthetic division, right? Yes? So you pick a number, and you apply synthetic division. Now, are you just want to, going to pick any number? Are you going to want to pick 5? We already talked about this, right? You don't want to pick 5 because we already know 5 is a rational number, and 5 is not a rational number that's listed on the possible rational numbers. Now, there's two ways you guys can determine this. If you guys remember the remainder theorem, let's, the easiest thing to do is, remember, these are all plus or minus. So I need to determine all the zeros. If I don't have a graph in front of me, I don't know what the possible zeros could be. So guess what? I'm going to have to guess and check. Now, that means I can determine it's a zero by two different ways. I can use synthetic division. So I'll just use 1 and negative 1, right? Why do synthetic division for 36 off the bat? You can do it. But why check 36 first? Let's check 1 and negative 1. Would everybody agree 1 and negative 1 are probably your easiest? Especially if you have fractions here. You know, if you have like 2 thirds, you're going to want to do 1 and negative 1 before you do a fraction. Would everybody agree with me? Yes. Now, again, this is me without a calculator or a graph in front of me. Um, now, the other way you could do that is remember, we could also plug in f of 1, right? Even if we just plug in 1 into this and we determine if f of 1 equals 0, then what? x equals 1 is a 0, correct? So you guys could probably look at this and say, all right, if I put 1 in here, is that going to make it 0? And I can already initially know that 1's not going to work, right? And if I plug in negative 1, I know negative 1's not going to work. But what's the fun in doing that? Are you guys following me, or do you guys need me to show me that? Do I need to show you that? Remember, whatever you plug in in the remainder theorem, that's your remainder of synthetic division. Do you guys remember the remainder theorem? No? Oh, OK. So let's do synthetic division, all right? 1, negative 7, don't forget the 0, 36. 1, negative 7, don't forget the 0, 36. Remember, the 0 represents the linear term, all right? A lot of students will forget that. So if we apply synthetic division, 1. 1 times 1 is 1, negative 6. Negative 6 times 1 is negative 6, uh, negative 6. Negative 6 times 1 is negative 6, 30. What I'm trying to tell you guys is f of 1 equals 1 cubed minus 7 times 1 squared plus 36. 1 minus 7 plus 36. f of 1 equals 30. Remainder theorem, right? Remember? Remainder theorem, you need to know that on your test. So make sure you guys can prove that that's a 0 or not a 0 by using a synthetic division and also by using the remainder theorem by plugging it in. Okay. However, does anybody know why would, why would I pr prove, why would I want to show, if I can find a 0, why would I want to show it by synthetic division rather than by using this remainder theorem here why, or by, by plugging it in? What's the difference? They both tell you if it's a 0 or not. But why is synthetic division preferred? Does anybody know yet? Yeah, you want to try it? Right, just give an answer. You, call. you know? Um, you want to try? I think. OK, you don't want to try, I think. Does anybody want to give an answer? Yes, Brittany? Yeah. Brittany. Yeah, exactly. Here, what does this tell you? What is 30? 30 is the what? Remainder, right? And that's what you get. You get a remainder. It's not a 0. When you do it this way, with just synthetic division, Hey, you get the remainder, right? But you also get the quotient. And remember, the quotient of synthetic division is also a factor, right? And once we have a factor, we want to find the remaining zeros. So if we have a factor, we know that we can set it equal to 0 and solve to find all the remaining factors, all right? So let's try negative 1. 1 didn't work, so let's go to negative 1. Bring down the 1. 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. Negative 8. Negative 8 times 1 is a positive 8. 8. 8 times negative 1, negative 8. That's not going to work, right? Uh, 28. So therefore, they both have remainders. So if I didn't have a graphing technology, what's the next easiest uh, rational possible 0 I can do? 2. 2, negative 2. Now, to save some time, do um, you have the graphing calculator up? Did you graph it? 2 doesn't work. All right. 
Well, if you didn't have a graphing calculator, how are you going to know that? You're not. You're going to have to do it. All right? But guess what? 2 is going to have a remainder. But I think 3 is looking pretty good. So let's check 3. So if I do 3, I bring down the 1. 1 times 3 is 3. Negative 7 plus 3 is negative 4. Negative 4 times 3 is negative 12. 0 plus negative 12 is negative 12. Negative 12 times 3 is a negative 36. Negative 36 plus negative 36 is 0. Yes? So therefore, now I have a remainder, which is 0. So therefore, it's a factor. Or that's a 0. Um, constant, linear, quadratic, right? So therefore, that is a 0. Yay, 0 equals 3. Therefore, if 0 equals 3, Ryan, what would be the factor form of that? If a 0 is 3, what's the factor form? Yeah, x minus 3. And do you remember the division algorithm? x minus 3 times what gives me my polynomial? The quotient, right? Remember, d of x times q of x plus r of x equals f of x? No. OK. So anyways, um, you take your factor. You don't have to multiply it by here, but we already know this is a factor. We take our factors. To get our factor to our 0, what do we do? x minus 3 equals 0. Solve. x equals 3. You take factors. You set them equal to 0 because remember, your factors, when we're trying to find our zeros, we factor it down, set them equal to 0. 0 product property, set them equal to 0. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I can take my factor, x squared minus 4x plus 12 equals 0. Oh my god, this, you have been giving us so many factoring problems. Well, that's all we've been doing on those worksheets is factoring. Why? Because you have to know how to factor. Is this factorable? If not, we have to use quadratic formula. But is it factorable? Yeah, it is, right? Ooh, wait, hold on. No, it's not factorable. Is it factorable? I'm not saying any factors. No, it's not supposed to be minus 12. Oh, it is supposed to be negative 12. Now it is factorable. Yes? So now, OK, that's perfect. All right, so now let's go back up to our, our information that we previously found. I have three rational zeros up there, right, that I just found. Are all three of these rational zeros a part of my list of rational zeros? Yes, yes right? Because we found out that 1 didn't work, 2 didn't work. But 3, negative 2 actually did work. So I should have probably checked negative 2, and I would have had the answer. But I didn't look at it. I didn't notice it. I just sound. But actually, 2 doesn't work, but negative 2 did work. I just didn't check it, right? Um, then 6 is works. Now let's go and take a look at the, the value of them. 6 and 3 are what? Positive or negative? Positive. And negative 1 is negative. So you have 2 positive and 1 negative. Hey, you're either going to have 2 or 0. Do we have one of those? Yeah, we have 2. And do we have 1 negative? Yes, OK? So that's if you don't have a calculator, what you need to do. Now, if you guys want to